Hello again. Last time I gave a quick overview of the goals of my video output project. In summary, I decided to use GAL chips to generate a 320 by 200 pixel display, masquerading as a 60Hz 640 by 480 VGA signal. I briefly showed my prototype board so far. This time I want to explain how I use the GALs and get to the point of generating addresses for RAM access. My chosen chip is the ATF 22V10. Now, a pedantic note, the ATF 22L V10 was more easily available in my area, and that's identical except for an additional fuse to enable a switchable low power mode, but I'll ignore that. This chip has 22 available pins, at which most 10 can be outputs. The heart of the GAL chip is a programmable matrix that feeds inputs into large OR gates for the outputs. Each line of the OR gate is made up of an AND of an arbitrary subset of the inputs, with each input being either plain or with a logical NOT. Each output can also be registered, meaning that it is actually the output of a flip-flop, denoted by the clock symbol here, producing a synchronous output. This can be very useful. It would be a bad idea to try to program the chip manually, so onto a compiler. The compiler I'm using is GAL ASM. The syntax is a little arcane and it's very sensitive to the layout. However, it does the job. The first two lines give the chip type and an eight character descriptor. This descriptor is written to eight spare bytes in the GAL's EEPROM. The layout block defines the pin names NC, VCC, GND and clock have special meanings. There's also an option for OE for output enable, but I'm not using that. Output pins are identified by having an expression. The dot R suffix indicates that it's a registered output. The rest of the pins are implicitly inputs, I believe. The description block is required, but I generally leave that blank. Expressions can't use parentheses so you have to use De Morgan's laws to rearrange each expression into an OR of ANDs. Next video, I hope to show my magic program that does this. For programming, I'm using the trusty TL8662+. It's possible to get the software running under Linux. See the link in the description. Compiling the code using Galassum produces multiple files, the most important of which is the JED file. In the programmer, I select the ATF22V10CUES. That UES is actually quite significant. So to find this, I search for ATF22V10 and select the right one. I can then load the .jet file. I can click program. And it's very important to uncheck this lock bit, otherwise it just won't work. So it is programming. And then, probably because I'm mildly paranoid, I always do a verify. And that's the basic mechanics of programming. Last time, I mentioned that I needed a counter for each of the horizontal position, vertical position and address. But before I get too much into that, I want to explain why I want a synchronous or pipelined design. Imagine a simple horizontal counter. When it reaches 400, it must wrap around to zero and cause the vertical counter to increment. If I compare the value of the counter using logic gates, there is a propagation delay before that H is 400 expression yields true and then a delay before the horizontal counter is reset and the vertical counter is updated. I've exaggerated the timing delays, but even so, this momentary transition to H equals 400 and the delay in increasing the vertical counter can cause timings to be off. In contrast, imagine the same horizontal counter, but this time the design will be fully synchronous. This will mean that the vertical counter is clocked at the same rate and needs access to the horizontal counter to detect when H is 399, so that it knows to increment on the next cycle. Notice that it's the state from cycle N that controls the state of cycle N plus 1. 
This allows us to sidestep quite a lot of the propagation delays as long as they're within certain limits. This here is a pipeline of one cycle, and it means it's necessary to check for h equals 399 and not h equals 400. Since both the horizontal counter and the vertical counter need to know when h equals 399 to reset to zero and increment respectively, it would be great to consolidate that into one single output of the horizontal counter. This output I've called he399 for h equals 399. But since it's now a registered output, it needs to indicate that h equals 399 for cycle n plus 1. Therefore, the value of h will be 1 less at 398 when being checked on cycle n. This is what I've tried to show with my arrows here. It's now a pipeline of two cycles, and this kind of adjustment is probably one of the more confusing things of a pipeline design. A final note. This sort of pipeline is only useful where there is a regular pattern. Video is great because the cycles are completely predictable. It becomes a lot more complex for CPU design or even memory logic connecting to a CPU, where the next instruction or memory access is hard or impossible to predict. As well as the counters, some flags are required. The basic ones here are for controlling the resetting of H and V, incrementing V, and the two sinks. I've created my own terminology here using an arrow to indicate that this value will be present on the next clock cycle. HE399 is the simplest, as it matches a single value. Since the H counter only requires 9 bits, there is one spare bit in this chip, which I will use for HE399. This also means the reset can be used internally for the counter. Even though it's within the same chip, the expression is read against cycle n for the result for cycle n plus 1, meaning it looks for 398, not 399. The clear, well, this might be pointless, it was there for accurate startup, which I haven't implemented and I'm not sure I will. VE524 is basically the same, except that all 10 output bits are used in the V counter. So I had to move it to the separate V flags chip. And since it's only used in conjunction with HE399 to reset the V counter at the very end of the display, there's no need to worry about the result being shifted one cycle late. HS, that is horizontal sync, needs to match a range of values. H is incremented on each clock. So the logic can check for H not being between seven and 54 inclusive, one offset from the values in my timing table to account for the pipeline. The not is because sync is active low. This is a more complicated expression, and even though it's possible to do with a giant Carnot map on a piece of paper, if you have enough patience, I definitely did not work that out manually. I hope to show my simulator program in the next video. Vertical sync. The saying is that there is more than one way to skin a cat. My first approach was to trigger the state change on boundary conditions. That is, clear Vs when V will become 50 and H will become 0, and set Vs when V will become 52 and H will become 0. The term H will become 0 on the next clock is this HE399 flag. This approach uses the feedback from the GAL registered output to read the current value of the output as part of the expression. The second approach is to build a complete expression. Because it's evaluating one cycle ahead, it's not quite as simple as v equals 50 or v equals 51. In the end, the expressions look about the same in terms of complexity. So I went with the first. If the display is going to contain anything other than black, it will be necessary to read the memory. I'm going for a bitmap display with a linear layout to make this simpler, at the cost of more memory being used. I'm using four bits per pixel as a compromise between memory usage and available colors. This means a single byte holds two pixels. The heart of the generator is simple. At the start of the screen, we set the address to a defined value. I'll read that as an input to the counters and hopefully be able to wire that 
an addressable latch for the CPU to write, much later on. When in the visible area, the address must be incremented on every other visible pixel. Since I'm halving the resolution, I have to display each line twice. So, at the end of an even line, I subtract 160. That's 320 pixels divided by 2 pixels per byte. However, this needs some adjustment. There's a pipeline of work to be done. The address is generated, provided to the RAM chip. The RAM chip provides the output, and that has to be decoded twice, once for each pixel in the byte. I've tried to show the pipeline in a table here. See how work has to start before the RGB values are being sent to the monitor. Now here's a timing diagram. It's sometimes best to work backwards. The starting point is that when H becomes 80, he wants a pixel to be outputted as RGB. This means that there is a trigger for visibility which goes high when H becomes 79. I call this VIS. There's also a limit on the values for V, but I'll deal with that later. To give the RAM the maximum time possible to respond, any changes to the RAM inputs need to be made two cycles before the first nipple from that pixel will be outputted. For the very first byte, RE, or that's what I call read enable, will be set to enable the output enable and chip enable of the RAM. I'm not wired this up now, as it's not relevant until I connect it to the CPU board. For subsequent bytes in the row, the address has to be incremented. To control this, ink address will be set on every other pixel. Notice the entire pipeline is three to four cycles long. Starting from ink address, we increment the address, that then propagates, and then it's only on the third and the fourth cycle afterwards that we display the pixels. I have drawn on a propagation delay for the data, as the RAM has no latching of data. Just a quick note on propagation delays. From the spec sheet, the chip requires at least 3.5 nanoseconds for the inputs to be set up before the rising edge of the clock. And then there's between 3 and 7.5 nanoseconds for the output propagation. Since there are two bytes per pixel, that leaves a total of 148 nanoseconds for the RAM to respond to a read. I have two types of RAM chip available at the moment, one with a 15 nanosecond access time and a slower one at 55. Both are plenty fast enough. You'll hopefully see why I mention this number when I preview the circuit connected to an EEPROM. So here is a preview of the output of my simulator. I will go into more detail later. On the left, we have V, as you can see, hasn't incremented on this run. We have H, which is incrementing on each clock. And we have the address. And here I've outputted a number of different flags, some which I haven't actually talked about in this video. You can see that RE goes high at 78. You can see the VIS goes high at 79. And you can see the alternating ink address. And you can also see that this does have an impact on the address. And skipping massively ahead, here's a preview of the board connected to an EEPROM. Here's the crystal, a flip-flop acting as a frequency divider. Two counters feeding into two flags chips. They then trigger the address chips, which I'll talk about next time. And there's a pixel decoder chip, which produces some RGB output. Um, hidden underneath this wire are some resistors acting as a very crude DAC, and there's the EEPROM. So if I fire it up and connect it to a VGA-capable monitor, you'll see a nice picture. So I have the 16 colour palettes at the top right, with the standard eight colours in dim and in brighter forms. Zooming in, you can see some of the pixels flickering. Remember that 148 nanosecond limit on RAM access time? Well, the EEPROM has a delay of a whopping 150 nanoseconds. I'm guessing that there's some variation in access time on the EEPROM depending on whether we're switching between internal banks of memory. I'm not entirely sure. Well, I hope you enjoyed seeing my thought processes. This is a completely novel thing for me, 
I only really started looking into this about two or three months ago. So I've learned a huge amount and I'm probably making quite a number of mistakes, but I hope it's a fun ride. Next time, I hope to cover my logic generator program, a simulator, and the joys of the address generator. Thank you for watching.